Ah, so we'll let, yeah, we'll give folks a minute. I'll just start by talking about my neighborhood and where it's really cold and foggy and that here it's so, yeah, and then here it's so warm and just, um, yeah, it's really interesting to be living in these different realities, which fits so beautifully with what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I think that the the teaching we're going to cover today is, is one of my all time favorites. I think that every time I come back to it, there's just so much richness. So we're going to be kind of touching into a practice called mindfulness of feelings, a Vedana practice. I assume um, some folks in the room. Oh, yeah, we've got the baby. Yes. Babies are good at this practice. Um, very clear on the sensory experience and then recognizing pain, pleasure, neutral, right? Um, the essence of the Vedana practice is really being able to work with both our bodily sensations as we'll do today, but also like our thoughts and experiences and recognizing when our feelings in the body feel pleasant, unpleasant and neutral. It seems like the simplest thing, but it's so complex and nuanced and beautiful. And um, as I will share from the book itself, it really is. It's one of the keys that unlocks our freedom. And when I say freedom, I mean, it unlocks the ability to have something like a calm mind, peace of mind. Um, so it's very, I find it very inspiring. So I'll just give us a little bit of um, framing to where we are and um, what we're covering right now in the context here and welcome everybody to the Dharma Collective. So if it is your, you know, hundredth time plus here, welcome, great to have you. And if it's your first time here, I see some new faces, really welcome. Um, this is a volunteer run center, welcome. Sit wherever you like, it's so nice to see you. Yeah, get up front. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> good. Yes. Uh, this is an entirely volunteer run center, which is quite unique. Most centers that are uh, meditation centers, there's usually an organization or a specific teacher. And this center really rose up out of a desire that it would be a community run center. And as a community run center, it means that we really lead here um, and show up here with specific values that are most important to us. And those values are really around creating a space where we can practice together and feel at ease. So the values include an ability and uh, invitation to sit with compassion so that when we feel we can really be here and be present and have a sense of care for ourselves, that we can listen with compassion to one another. So I'll start by offering some teachings and a guided meditation, but a big part of our community here is discussion. We don't learn as much by listening as we learn by reflecting, right? It's not just what we're hearing, but then how do we apply it? How do we hear others talk about it? How do we ourselves respond? And to do so, we really you know, use compassion recognizing that whatever we are hearing, whether it's from myself or someone else in this room, that we are hearing with this um, kind of freshness as though we can't assume or know where it is coming from in another person. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna ask not to eat during the class. Thank you. Um, very few rules here, but one of them is yeah, not eating during the session, just so we can all um, be in silence. Another one is when we are meditating, a uh, hope is you could use the bathroom either before or after we meditate, just so we can kind of have that semblance of quiet and stillness in the room. And another really important part of our practice and the center is, you know, really taking this ethic of non-harming. And that seems so simple, right? Okay, like non-harming, I won't get in a fight while I'm here. But non-harming also in our thoughts and in our intentions. So can we show up with ourselves? So if we raise our hand and we ask a question to do so with a sense of real care and confidence, like I'm gonna ask this question, even if I don't know if it makes any sense, even if someone's already asked it. 
So when we're here, we're really engaging in non-harming through all of our behaviors, all of our thoughts together. How's that sound? It's an aspiration. It's, it's hard, but it's so important and really important that we bring the values and integrity of our practice into when we're talking and then hopefully when we leave this place as well. So I've been teaching for the last six months from this unbelievably long but very beautiful book. Um, and the book itself is it's almost like a, a set of stories. And these are the collected stories of the historical life of the Buddha. So from when he's born to when he finds enlightenment uh, to all the way of when he is teaching. And right now where we are in the story, he has been teaching for 10 years. He has thousands of disciples. He has more than a dozen centers, but some of the most important teachings of his life are just uncovered like month by month, year by year. It's really beautiful. Like we all hear the teachings of the Buddha or meditation and mindfulness. It's like in a manual, right? Or it's in a book and it's all laid out. But in this way, we hear it as he is engaging with the world. And we see how these teachings are so alive. It's not that someone sat in a room thinking and then they wrote down all these teachings. It's really how he interfaces with other people, including difficulties within his own Sangha, but including just looking so deeply at a single leaf. Everything is an opportunity to kind of have an inspiration, to have a new understanding of reality that helps us feel more open, more clear, and more compassionate. And we've hit the part of the teachings where he delivers what is called the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, and Sutta is a word that just means teachings. Many of the stories in this book are from small suttas, but the Satipatthana Sutta is like, it's the big one. It's the most maybe um, foundational one, often called for foundations of mindfulness included in these teachings as well. And Everyone, I assume, in this room has definitely heard the word mindfulness. If you haven't heard the word Satipatthana Sutta, and it's really bringing together these essential aspects of mindfulness. Mindfulness, including an ability to concentrate or pay attention, but also an ability to have insight and deeper understanding. Concentration on its own amazing. We could all use more concentration. I last week quoted this um, recent kind of piece of data that I saw that people's attention span on their screen is about 17 to 30 seconds, right? So you're looking at this thing, you're looking at that thing, you're looking at the other, and that creates, you know, I'm, I want you all to look and notice your own experience, but that can often create just a sense of dis-ease when we're constantly kind of looking here, looking there, looking to the next place, our mind doesn't have a place to rest. And for many of us, it's what we do, and maybe it's even required as part of our job to be paying attention to so many different things. But then when we're not at work or when we are you know, on a vacation and doing whatever it is we want, we may also find that we don't have that attention. We don't have that ability to even focus on the book we wanna be reading or the conversation we're having with someone else. It's extremely embarrassing and awkward, right? When you've been trying to listen to someone, maybe me right now, you've been trying to listen to someone for five minutes, you're like, I'm like not here. Like, where am I? I'm thinking about dinner. I'm thinking about what happened right before I came here. So this simple ability to develop concentration, this is part of our mindfulness practice. And in the last couple of weeks, we did the mindfulness of breathing which again is such a simple and foundational practice, but it has such power. If we can notice something as subtle and fine grained as the breath, we can notice something as subtle and fine grained as those thoughts and feelings that arise and that kind of capture us and carry us away. So developing this simple ability to concentrate and recognize whenever we have fallen away from the breath, it's really essential. And with the mindfulness of breathing, we also are noticing the very quality of our breath. We kind of assume that every breath, yeah, it's just breath, you know, we're breathing. But some breaths are longer, and some breaths are shorter. And to have that real receptivity that each breath could be a little different, that's the quality of concentration and mindfulness. 
So it's not this kind of locked in, like I'm just paying attention, I'm breathing, I'm going to count each breath. Counting is great. But this real like, oh, what is the next breath going to be like? So this kind of gentle, really precise paying attention. We can really get a little caught up in the tightness of our attention and concentration. And that moves us away from mindfulness. So in addition to concentration, we also have insight. And it's so interesting. It's such a beautiful relationship between insight and attention. So if we start to notice, for example, that our breaths indeed are a little bit distinct, they actually shift and change. We start to have insight into the reality that everything changes. We know that as a concept. We know that everything changes. The seasons change. I mean, the seasons change in this city in 10 block radius. Uh, but, you know, everything is changing all the time. But to really know that, to know it because we've observed it. And tonight, we're going to kind of dig into that kind of knowing by observing the sensations in the body. So before we do so, I want to do a little experiment, kind of like calibrate ourselves of what is this practice of Vedana? So before we begin the real practice, I invite you, if it's comfortable, to close your eyes or to at least have a gaze that's inward. And to really just notice and feel what it's like to be in the body in this moment. For some of us, this can be a bit awkward or uncomfortable, like where in the body or how. And maybe for others of us, there's just all these different areas of sensation in the body. And often we think about the body in a very general way, like how how's your body? Maybe we think, oh, it's good or it's tired, but let's get a little more refined and noticing how's the body right now. And then I'm going to invite us to Bring our, our right hand and start to kind of wiggle the fingers a bit. And then clench the fist in your right hand really, really, really tight. And notice what is the sensation of this tight clenching? How does it feel in the hand? How does it make you feel emotionally? And then just kind of gently release it. And notice the release. And how does that feel? In both cases, there's sensation. In both cases, there's the hand. What's different about those sensations? And I'm going to ask you to take the right hand and put it on top of the left hand, almost as though a friend was putting a hand on top of your hand. And for a moment, actually imagine that a dear friend is just gently putting their hand on top of yours. And how does that feel to receive this as though it were the tender feeling of a friend's hand comforting you or supporting you. And then gently releasing and allowing the hands to just sit naturally on the lap. And very gently wiggling fingers and toes and blinking eyes back open into this room in our shared space. 
So when you clenched the fist, what did you feel? What were the actual sensations? How would you describe that? <clears throat> Maybe uh, testosterone. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my uh, my pulse rate went up, mm. and I was ready to fight. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that. I mean, who knows why? Yeah, you know, I'm not. I don't fight with people. Yeah, you know, yeah. At least not for many, many years. Yeah, but it was like, uh, yeah, and uh, that was. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, opening up this, yeah. Yeah. And when and with the tightness, could you describe the actual like what what did it feel like? The sensation of tightness there. Um. I don't know if it's right or yeah. tense. Uh, yeah. A lot of tension. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, yeah. goes along with the pulse rate, you know. Yeah. Tense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so interesting while you point that out. Um, two things. One is, indeed, when we feel angry, there is a there is blood that rushes to our hands, right? That's an evolutionary predisposition that we have. Um, so it's that we know that you can kind of kind of fake a smile on the face, right? Especially if you have the eyes involved. And some of the kind of dopogenic system starts to feel happy too, right? Like smiling makes you happy. So your fist was making you feel angry, which is which is interesting. And I think. We often, you know, when we have a sensation um, like we're making a, a fist, we can experience it. Like you were saying, there was kind of a, a lot of energy and tension and maybe even anger, aggression. Um, but it's hard for us to describe like, oh, yeah, it's warm. It's heavy. Like the, the kind of the, the phenomena of what's actually in the fist. And that is often what we're trying to do is like disentangle how we feel about the sensation from the sensation. So anybody else, how did you experience the closed fist? What did you notice? I could tell me names. Thank you. You feel, yes, and that, not good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's so interesting, right? Because again, it's so hard and so subtle, but it's actually just pressure and pointiness. But immediately we're like, I don't like that. It doesn't feel good, right? There's an immediate, what we say, like attribution or a label or a projection. So one of the most magical things about the mindfulness of feelings is it can liberate us from unnecessary pain, from the pain that we add on to the experience itself. So when we're like, okay, that's pointy and it's unpleasant, but you know, if I knew this was an acupressure point and it helped me, maybe I would like it, right? You think about a really hard massage. I mean, like, that's like a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, a lot of, especially like an elbow, a lot of intensity in there, but it can feel very like good because we believe it's good. So there's so much that we add on to the experience. Mm -hmm. and, and how about like that feeling of the, the friend. Anybody notice any kind of qualitative experience of holding one's own hand? Yeah, that was super soothing. Soothing. Yeah. 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 I felt warm. Warmth. I felt warm and I was sick. And I was, I can't describe it around my heart. I just felt tingly, lightness. Effervescence. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, again, it's, it can go both ways. Our attribution can make it feel worse and harder, or we can decide like, this is a friend holding me and this feels good. It's just so interesting to really start to, again, directly experience and, and know, wow, my mind is a huge part of my experience. Because very often we feel like we are just prisoners to our sensory experience. 
like I, on my way here, I mentioned this, not a huge deal, but it's a good example. I think, you know, it was very cold in the Castro, like wind and fog. And so I put on all these layers to bike over and, um, and then it was sun and then I was really hot. <laughs> and my immediate thing was like, I hate this. Like, this is bad. And it's like, it's just hot. It's not bad, you know, but this, and then you can go extra story. Like, the Castro. Like I was born and raised in the Castro. We got a long relationship. And I'm like, when am I going to move to Potrero? Like where it's warm. And I would like just have one layer, you know? So it's like so much added content onto our bear experience. And like such a beautiful opportunity in this practice. So simple, but noticing just sensation. Right. And I wanted us to do this little calibration together because when we're sitting and doing this practice, it's going to be really subtle. Right. Maybe you'll notice that uh, there's an itch and you notice like it's again, itches are really interesting. Is it really bad? Like is an itch like bad? Like maybe I like it. Actually, maybe I don't need to scratch it. But then if you decide to scratch it, noticing What is the, like, what is the sensation after scratching? Like just getting so clear and so specific. So noticing if we are considering it to be pleasant, something we like, unpleasant, something we don't like, neutral. And then also as much as possible, getting this kind of granular precision. Like I remember once on retreat, um, I could actually have a sense of a sneeze coming. And I actually thought it was like ecstatically blissful because everything else was so boring. Right. And like it coming, I was just like, wow, you know, like sneezing, you know, anyway, I I got the snuff thing finally, like no wonder people like sneezing so much. So can we really like pull apart the sensation and just like notice it? And this allows us to be scientists of our own mind. This, the Buddha is like a scientist, right? He's an incredible scientist. And what's for me as someone involved in contemplative science, so encouraging is there is no measure or mechanism out there that can tell you more about your felt experience than your own mind. Yeah, we can tell like blobs of movement in different areas, you know, but we can't actually understand what you are feeling, why you are feeling it. That is all yours. So it's really, I think, just so encouraging and beautiful to start to take on, wow, I can be a scientist of my own mind and actually be the scientist of my own mind, really train this inner instrument of noticing. And, you know, like Walt's noticing of like, wow, there's actually aggression there. Like that's, that's like a really interesting insight that my body influences my emotional system. It's an invenerated system. So, um, I hope I'm getting you pumped for what might be a very boring practice. Are we ready? Okay, good. So if you want to stand up, I know we've been sitting for a minute. Feel free to stand up and stretch a little and do a longer sit. I have an itch that I've been walking for the past couple of minutes. How is it? It's it's like infuriated. It's so <laughs> right. Watching the dog. I know it has it like compressed and kind of come down too. It's amazing that like conditioned response. Like it's so weird to not immediately address it. Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> No, I, and then when, once you say itch, there's like, you know. I'm sorry, a, a couple of the worst experiences of my life have been cased in poison oak. Oh, yes, poison oak is, no, not going to help. And that's, it's such a beautiful metaphor, right? Because often, you know, such beautiful teachings by Pema Chodron. And she talks about don't scratch the itch. What she means is don't continue thinking about that thing (laughs) that you want to think about that actually makes you more upset. Like why they didn't call you back. 
or why they, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like that we just want to scratch the itch. And part of it is learning to observe the craving, right? And the craving includes just our desire to, to scratch, to move. Ooh, okay. So let's find, let's like get all your itches out. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely allowed to itch in this practice, but you have to do so mindfully and pause just a little bit. So our posture is such an important part of our practice. And such a beautiful way to signal to our body, our heart and our mind that we are doing something different. We are doing something that is a deeper cultivation. Doing something with the potential to transform, to liberate, to be of service. So finding and feeling an upright spine. And then inviting and relaxing through the front of the body, softening through the face and the chest and the belly. And finding a place for the hands to rest gently on the lap, maybe resting both hands on the thighs or folded in the lap. And feeling just the most gentle lift of the heart upward towards the sky. Beginning by really establishing a sense of our presence in this space, in this moment. Feeling a sense of the ground beneath us. The ground which has supported innumerable beings. And the ground which has gone through its own transformations but always stable and solid, ready to support. And feeling a sense of the space around us, the other beings in the room, if there are other beings. And having a sense of the sky above us here in San Francisco, the sun is still out. And feeling the space all around us as a way to help feel our body in this present moment. Located right in this moment. And choosing stillness, openness, and silence.
inviting the quality of stillness, not only by physically not moving, but the stillness of allowing whatever was happening before or whatever needs to happen next to just gently recede. In the stillness of fully giving ourselves to being right here. Nowhere else to be, nothing else to do. And inviting the quality of inner silence by gently following the breath, giving our mind one place to be. By noticing the inhale and the exhale. Breathing in, knowing that we are breathing in. Breathing out, knowing we are breathing out. And of course, the mind will get carried away by thoughts and memories, images. And when you notice your mind has been carried away, that's the very seed of developing your awareness and attention. So simply relax and return to focusing. Seeing if you can follow an entire cycle of breath through inhale and exhale. As you breathe in, feeling the whole body breathing, the whole body is receiving each breath, the whole body is extending each breath. Bring that gentle curiosity. What is it like for the whole body to be breathing in? What is it like for the whole body to be breathing out? Thank <laughs> you.
And just keep coming back over and over. Keep coming back to knowing the breath and the body. And so building upon the stillness and the silence, we invite the quality of openness to our practice. And we could experience this openness throughout the whole body. Or a sense of openness in the space around the body. Just giving ourselves a couple moments of spacious awareness. Instead of focusing on the clouds, like the breath, focusing on the sky, the awareness. Having settled our body, speech, and mind in these natural states, inviting the qualities of stillness, and silence, and openness, we bring to mind our motivation for being here. And part of the motivation, not only for our own well being, we're recognizing the collective nature of well being. Any way that we can train our mind and heart to be free can immediately be in service to supporting others to find that same freedom. So seeing if this feeling of bodhicitta the aspiration of an awakened heart can feel alive in this moment. Considering the countless beings so much in need of support and care. And feel that natural heart's desire that we could be of support and care to those near to us and those who we don't even know.
And just feeling the spark of bodhicitta. Just that very essence of caring. It is often said the motivation is the most important part of any action, whether meditation or other work in the world. So really taking a couple moments here to just feel into the motivation, the intention. Allowing the intention to become the background of our practice. We bring to the foreground of our practice this mindfulness of feeling. In this practice, we notice the subtle shifts and changes of sensations in the body. And noticing whether we experience them as pleasant, Mm -hmm. unpleasant, or neutral. And investigating with curiosity and kindness, what is the essence of these sensations? Does it feel like heaviness? Does it feel like tingling? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it effervescent? Is it warm? So as much as possible, bringing all of our mindfulness to the body, the sensations in the body, and allowing our concentration on the body to give way to insight, really seeing how we attribute these different sensations as being good or not feeling good. And also noticing what we just consider to be neutral. If we have a desire to move because something has fallen asleep or feels uncomfortable, notice the sensations of discomfort and slowly notice, move and shift. And then notice what feels pleasant. If we have a desire to itch, again, notice what are the particular sensations of something that is itching. And waiting and slowly choosing to scratch the itch and then noticing the feeling of relief, pleasantness. becoming a first-person scientist of our felt experience.
Of course, the mind will get carried away. No problem. Just returning and noticing as you refresh your interest in sensations in the body. What do you notice first? What area is the sensation? Do you really notice as you come back into awareness, back into mindfulness of the body? And as our noticing gets subtler and subtler, there may be a sense of just pleasantness, not located in any one place, just a presence of a baseline sense of pleasant. Again, noticing the qualities that we feel to be pleasant the qualities that we feel to be unpleasant. I'm curious, is it possible to experience them as just qualities, just sensations? There is no success in this practice. It just is continuing to come back over and over to noticing, developing breath by breath our attention and making space for the possibility of insight.
for the remaining moments of this practice, really consider that whenever our attention and awareness is in the body, we're in the present moment. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> Questions, reflections on the practice? Anyone in this room is their first time doing that practice? Sweet. Anyone in this room felt like it was the first time doing that practice? Oh, good. Yeah. What are, and uh, if folks don't mind, they could, in the room, pull that mic towards them. You can, it's actually really long. You can bring it all the way to your seat. Yes, please. The exercise with the fist stuck with me mm -hmm. and made me uncomfortable the whole time. Oh, my forearms were just oof. Mm. so I had a very hard time sitting still. Wow. Huh. So it just like it like activated. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. On both sides, even though it was only the one. Huh. And was there any like thought with it? I couldn't find one, but I had this kind of feeling of nausea and just like, oh, I got to get out of this. Hmm. Wow. And how, how was it to sit with that? Or I started stretching my, my uh, forearms and that, and that intense feeling feels so much better of mm. the intense stretch. Yeah. Yeah. And so when that was happening, was it, you, were you able to notice like pleasant? Yeah. 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 I'm sorry to hear about that, but then again, it's, yeah, it's also, and as long as it isn't too, um, distracting or difficult there there is no like wrong and so it's been interesting like that strong response and also like i wonder if we hadn't gone into meditation would you have even noticed right i think it's come up for me two or three times in meditation over i don't know 20 years so rarely wow huh on always when it's like after some physical act who knows well, i want to know more but we'll just talk about it I yeah have tense forearms Okay. And so be bringing awareness to them. It's all, yeah. See, that is, that's the thing about mindfulness that that's like the dirty secret for everyone who wants to make it a commercial prospect is it actually often makes you more aware of the garbage dump of your mind and all these other aspects of your um, experience and situation. And you're like, Oh man, this is making me worse. Like mindfulness is bad for me, but you're actually bringing to surface, you know, and I don't know if folks notice that in the body. You're like, I didn't know my body was so messed up before I sat into that practice. Like there's all these, wow, there's like so many things. Um, and again, it's not, not necessarily a problem. And it is hopefully helping us see the way that we respond to those very natural experiences and feelings in the body. And especially the way that we can maybe add that extra layer of like, this is bad and wrong. It shouldn't be happening. Um, yeah. Anyone else? So I think I started attending these Wednesdays in April after you taught here with Lama Sultra. Mm -hmm. And this has been such a growth experience mm -hmm. for me. So glad. And I was so looking forward to tonight. 
I almost didn't come because I've got some retreat work that I'm doing this weekend and I've got to get ready. But no, no, no. This is this is part of preparation for what I'm going to be doing with Lama this weekend. Oh, yeah. Uh, but then I found out on my way over here that someone has raided my checking account mm-hmm. and <laughs> I got a notification that somebody spent a bunch of money at a store that I don't shop at and I ignored it and now I'm going to have to go track that down. So how do I clear my mind stream mm-hmm. uh, so that it doesn't take away from the bliss that I enjoy in, in yeah. this practice. Yeah. And I, what came to my mind was the, the Grinch who stole Christmas, you know, and the, the who's come down and they're just like, yeah, whatever the, you know, the feast yeah. it's about being together and singing. Yeah. You know, so what was just so lovely was, um, and, you know, from having done this for a number of weeks now uh, that I was able to let go of the mind stream Mm. and experience the bliss. And then the bliss cleared the mind stream. Mm, Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very sorry to hear about the financial rupture. Oh yeah. Back, back. Um, I, j- I just wanted to say that I had an experience where I, I haven't been in the room for a while. I've been sitting at home and it's very different. And my experience of sitting today was yeah. my body was very quiet, but all of a sudden it started actually kind of doing things that I didn't, I wasn't conscious of. Hmm. Like, I think I've been moving a lot when I meditate, but because I've been in my own house or my own chair, I haven't really noticed. And like all of a sudden my feet were moving, you know, and I was like, better stop that. And then um, just sort of weird things that I wasn't, it was like the itch, but it wasn't something I was aware of until yeah. tonight sitting. So I just thought that was interesting. It's yeah. part of my body. My body was actually doing things that I wasn't consciously willing or doing. It's yeah. Kind of like, so the practice is good for just trying not to do that. But how do you feel about movement and meditation? I mean, because stillness is, I don't know where to, I don't know where I draw the line. Like, do I want to just sit? completely still or sort of i don't know what do you yeah. what do you think about um before i answer that i'm curious did it feel pleasant unpleasant or neutral when your body wanted to move it was fine yeah. but it was kind of like um the connection between my thought and my my movement was uh, i i think it's this if i if i can kind of drop it you know this idea of like okay i have an impulse drop it um I wasn't even aware of the impulse. It just sort of happened. So I'm kind of wondering if I should try to just be super still, but I've always felt like I was kind of forcing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm just kind of curious if what the value of and what the goal is in stillness. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this and, and it has evolved with my own practice. You know, I learned in a, in a pretty traditional way, my like root teacher, Alan Wallace is um, very traditional and offers teachings that um, have been used for thousands of years. And they are not necessarily the teachings that were used with people who live in the contemporary environments that we live in. And does that mean they are not the right way? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I do know that I think if you are living, especially like think about Tibet, you know, eight months of the year, you're snowed in to a monastery. That's different, (laughs) you know? And, you know, you think a lot of these practices, there's just like a, it's like a, just a simpler time. Right. And a lot more connection with, with honestly like vast open space i've ever seen seen to that i've never been fortunate to go there but you know like a lot of space you can see just like different on the nervous system than the environments that we're in does that mean we just surrender and we're like mm, it's too hard i'm gonna move because my nervous system is messed up right there's so many things being thrown at me i'm multitasking um i'm i'm not sure 
And there are, I was super fortunate to teach with this, this beautiful teacher, um, Alejandro Chaul, who does Tibetan yogas. And those are practices in which there is deliberate, specific movement. It's really subtle and gentle. Um, but I find I use those before I do a still practice. So instead of it being like, I move however I want, it's like, I'm going to do some deliberate contemplative movement, right? Tai Chi, Qigong, there's like such beautiful ways to bring the mind into the body in a very deliberate way. So I think to me, it seems that I think those practices have always been useful. My guess is they may be more useful than ever in our time to like as a bridge. I actually even think that riding my bike here helps me settle in you know, just some movement and activity, like my favorite way to practice this morning, I took like a, um, a, a walk early in the morning and like sat down right in the middle of the walk. So there's the, you know, feeling the movement and then stillness. And it feels as though the body has like expended some amount of energy that you can then kind of more easily relax in. Um, and I do think stillness has a huge teaching opportunity for us. I wish I could say like, doesn't matter. Like just move. It's the same, but I don't think so. When, when I've had the opportunities to sit for longer periods of time. Wow. I mean, stillness is just, it is, it's like, it's like the, there's no word, but it is so deep. It is just so deep. And what it teaches you <clears throat> through the body, um, the mind, you know, kind of like you were saying, the mind stream informing um, the like your your body starts to really inform the mind how to be. And it's, you know, it's like that um, famous analogy of the water that's all stirred up because it has you know, dirt in the bottom of it. And then when it gets to still, the dirt is just all the way at the bottom and there's just clarity all the way through. So generally our mind is like that swirling dirt water <laughs> that's opaque and we can't see it, but just letting it all still. Um, and I think, yeah, it's really, and it, you know, you look at different traditions and how people pray and how people practice. There's so much kind of beauty in like the postures of prayer and practice. And that often includes chanting humming. Um, and I think all those practices can, again, help settle the body. And then there's like stillness. So there's not one way, though. I, I do think, you know, other than the Tibetan yogas in, in most Buddhist meditation, other than walking, there isn't a lot of movement, but it's not a problem to want to move. It's being aware that you want to move and then moving instead of just not even realizing and moving. So. Yeah, thank you. Isabella raised her hand and she's on Oh, great. Hi, thank you. Hi there. Watch. Um, so yeah, I'm meditating with a baby and <laughs> the, this is my third session. And the first time I came, they were asleep the whole thing. So I was like, oh, this can actually work. But this the past section and this section, they are asleep. Um, yeah. So a lot of my practice was like to to be with the baby and yeah. and try to accept and adapt to that and and I mm. guess I experienced a little bit of frustration and impatience and I could mm. feel that as like a burning sensation in my stomach like mm. being frustrated and not being able to do anything about it um, yeah. And then I feel guilty because I feel frustrated about my baby. And then I feel a tightening in my heart. Yes. Um, so I don't know. I just recently came back to practice because it's so important for me. And but I I'm I always have a baby. So I just have been like, well, my practice is to be with this other being all the time and see how that goes and mm. um but I don't know sometimes it's difficult but it has been very interesting to observe myself with all of those feelings and also at some point you mentioned the intention of my practice and Elwin with my baby is my intention because I want to be 
giving the I really want them to be into mindfulness practices and I think the best way of doing that is being an example since the yeah. Yeah. So, yeah yeah thank you so much for this space it's very good thank I you Isabella yeah. you are you keeps are working so to be here strong. yeah yeah and it and no, you know what you're describing is honestly like the even higher level of this practice, right? So there's noticing the sensations, but you were able to even notice like that it created the frustration and the sensation of frustration in the belly. And that's, you know, already, okay, wow. I noticed not only are there physical sensations in my body, there are emotional sensations in my body and we don't like that feeling. I mean, it's so amazing the possibility that we could just be with our anger as sensation, like that is just a really beautiful process. It's so hard because we want to, you know, either justify our anger or succumb to that feeling of guilt or shame. You know, it's so hard to just be like, here's anger, but it's, it's really interesting. And I think it's such a beautiful intention when you're sitting in like air quotes, unideal settings, which you know, I think having a baby is, uh, can be a beautiful part of it, but obviously it's different. And, um, we have our own unideal here, like often jackhammers or Harleys, you know, like going by the center. And, um, it's really interesting to notice the contraction around it and the desire for it to be different, like just so fundamental so fundamental. Um, and I do think, you know, again, always in these teachings, it's what part can we, what part can we shift through choosing more deliberately to kind of not react? So having, you know, the baby moving around, feeling frustrated, very hard to change that. You know, our emotions are triggered in a 25th of a second to good luck. Right. So, but then feeling guilty about the anger again, it might happen quickly, but then how do we hold ourselves with that feeling? That is just, that is where we get a lot of choice. And it's so beautiful. I'm, I'm sure I've said it here before, but one of the very traditional analogies of how do we hold ourselves with compassion and how do we hold others with compassion is like, a mother holding a crying baby in the night and they can't tell you why they're crying and they can't tell you what they need. And you just hold them with love and no expectation of how they're going to be and what they're going to just, you just hold in love. So I think it's really wonderful to have that potential of seeing the love and care and intention for Elowin and then like bringing that to yourself. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else? Thoughts, questions? It's funny you mentioned root teacher because I was going to ask, <laughs> what exactly is a root teacher? Ah, a root teacher, that's the, it's usually who you learned your Dharma from first. So then there's like your heart teacher. That could be a different analogy altogether. But um, yeah, I learned from Alan Wallace. So like literally eternally grateful to him forever. Just such an incredible teacher. Um, and I learned so much from him, but currently I sit with another teacher. So she's my primary teacher and I've sat with her for eight years, see her every week. So that's a different kind of relationship. So I think we can have many different kinds of relationships with our teachers. Yeah. And I have a little, um, I was um, reading, Alan has a many 45 books. Um, so at least a couple of them have the Satipatthana Sutta in it because it's such a classic core teaching. Um, and yeah, I was loving what he, he said, this one quote, he said, we think that we are enslaved by our physical sensations. But what we can notice through this practice is to really see that you know, even these, you know, physical sensations like discomfort, they shift and change, you know, they're not all the time. Um, you know, some of our pains are longer and, and this really gets to the core of essentially like why mindfulness is such a household name is because practices like 
mindfulness of feelings are so effective in helping people reduce the amount of suffering around their pain. So MBSR for the first, I think, 15 years that it was taught, a lot of it was for chronic, I mean, the first study was for chronic pain patients, and it was used a lot with chronic pain because with pain, there's not only the sensation of pain, there is the feeling that we attribute like this is bad and wrong. I don't want to feel this way. So if we can develop that capacity to recognize here's the sensation and then here's me like enslaving myself to the pain by thinking about it and fixating on it. Just so simple and beautiful. Um, yeah. And, and one thing I really appreciate too, and Alan was sharing um, in one of his teachings is his root teacher is the Dalai Lama. And um, the Dalai Lama says that the very kind of essence, like the very um, like deepest human impulse is to care, right? Just to care. And part of that caring is I care if I'm experiencing something pleasant. I care if I'm experiencing something unpleasant. And that there's just this really kind of natural way um, that we are always responding to and kind of attending to and trying to reach some sort of homeostasis around our outer conditions and especially what we experience through our um, our physical senses, but also true for our mind. You know, like we want to be experiencing thoughts and feelings that are pleasant, not that they are unpleasant. and this uh, deepest desire to care leads not only to things like seeking joy, but also leads to things like craving and hatred, right? When we're really mad at someone, we really care, right? There's a sense of that's bad for me. I don't want that. And I just like that way of um, kind of framing and, and being with the difficulties that they are just one way of us caring. Um, which I think is beautiful. And one of the ways that um, in these classic teachings on, on Vedana that we're supposed to really consider the nature of our feelings is when we are observing our feelings, we consider, is what I'm experiencing intrinsically pleasant or unpleasant? Really often we're like, my back hurts, right? My shoulder hurts. It's hurting me. But the invitation here is like, is there something intrinsic about the hurt? Like, is it really unpleasant? Or is it a variety of sensations that we don't like? I know that's a little bit of a subtle difference. And I'm not trying to say that pain isn't real. It's just an attitudinal shift that's slightly different around how we respond to and be with our pain. And the other is, and this one maybe some of you observed, is, our, is any sensation truly static and unchanging? Or is it all changing? In the body, it's, it's, it's all changing. Right. There's nothing that's kind of fixed, all changing. And I think, you know, this idea um, and the third question is to really consider is the magnitude that I feel of pleasant or unpleasant. Is it actually the feeling or is it me? Like, Where is that coming from? <clears throat> it's it's just an interesting way to start playing with our, our felt experience. And it's funny because last week we talked about how little of the time we actually spend aware of being in our bodies. But when we're in pain, we are aware of being in our body. So it's kind of funny. It's like this signal. It's important life-saving signal, right? We need pain. And it's also a way that we actually are in our body in the present moment. Because <clears throat> I don't know about you all, but during the practice, Often we, our minds drift and we're not there and we're going somewhere else. And, you know, part of our mind wandering is seeking something pleasant, wanting to find something that's enjoyable. That's that part and that desire of care. Um, yeah. And I, I also love how, you know, Alan talks about in this teaching, um, 
we share this desire to feel less unpleasant and more pleasant, even with like single celled organisms, right? It's like such a fundamental experience. And one thing I really love that he weaves in is it's the foundation for our empathy. Being able to notice and experience difficulty and pain in our bodies is one way for us to be able to recognize and understand what's happening for others. Um, even, you know, non-human beings, you know, we recognize their difficulty and their struggle um, just as our own. So this idea of like, how can we start to feel a different relationship towards our pain instead of this is unpleasant and I don't want it to create suffering or the pain of like, wow, this helps me understand what other people are, are, are struggling with. I think this is definitely true for parents. I think I've heard from every parent. I had no idea how hard it was to be a parent until I was a parent. And that's, you know, of course the joys too, but there's a lot of, um, you know, empathy that is built. And part of this is fundamentally, can we use whatever we are experiencing as our path for awakening? without judgment, without preference. Like that's the key, right? <clears throat> My current teacher says that all of our experiences, pleasant and unpleasant, are alchemical fuel. And that alchemical fuel, that's the fire of our awakening. So when something really difficult happens to us, we think, oh, wow, I get to learn about all these parts of myself I didn't know about, right? Especially these tricky situations like, you know, a breakup or not feeling heard or seen at work or losing something we love or someone we love, we get to see so many aspects of ourselves where we're kind of still asleep, right? So if we think of awake as recognizing and understanding, asleep is just falling into your habitual patterns, kind of blaming others, not seeing reality clearly. So I, I appreciate that as kind of an opportunity, but we can also use our enjoyable experiences as fuel for awakening by letting that be, you know, like a source, like a resource for us, like fully enjoying it and fully recognizing this is going to help me in sustaining my path ongoing. I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful way to keep us in because it can be really <clears throat> challenging and we'd like to numb out and distract. And as I very often say, if numbing out and distracting worked, I would say, let's all go do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't. That's why we're here. It temporarily helps, but it doesn't get underneath. It doesn't really transform how we see the world. So we just hit our head up against the same problems over and over. So questions on this part yes please one thing that has been coming up for me as um we've been doing the practice and in the discussion is the kind of size of the attention mm. the you can think of different metaphors or feelings like during the meditation for example i felt that there was a time when you said say something along the lines of uh, and to think about breathing in with your whole body. Mm. And I had this moment of, well, the air is coming into my lungs and it's going into the bloodstream. And then I can feel all of the blood going all the way around. And so my attention kind of felt for a second, like it was pumped through kind of the, the whole thing. Mm. It's really, it's cool. Yeah. It lasted for some time. And then, um separately from that so this morning i was so excited to finally come back I'd, i've been gone for a few and i woke up this morning with the horrible crick in my neck mm -hmm. and the whole like you, you fall asleep you wake up your neck hurts yep. and it's very localized all day i've been like moving around and trying to fix you know you can't stop and at other times during the meditation, my attention was like very, very localized. Yes. Very small and very like precise. And it's like right there. But then when uh, some time into it, I started falling really into the stillness of it. And it kind of went away. Because my attention is on the other part of the back that was hurting. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it went back. But then this other part of the back 
stopped hurting. And then it got more precise mm-hmm. where um, I'd move my head very slightly. And I was like, oh, there's like a little fiber of mm-hmm. pain here. But no, if I if exactly here, it's fine. Mm. And then something else would catch my attention. So I started feeling like a kind of, it's like those kind of air traffic controller radars <laughs> that are like going around and the thing lights up and then it goes away and it fades <laughs> away and it lights up again. And, mm. and, uh, and I was, so I was just pondering like, the, the way the attention, it moves around, but also increases in size yes. and decreases in size. And it's very, it's unclear to me if it's po- possible to be attending to more than one thing mm-hmm. at a time. Is it like, your fovea and like the, the focal point of your vision or yeah. so really good noticing yeah like all around like so many threads that you're pulling so much. on yeah there's a it's a it's a long answer um i think you know it's it is like very helpful to actually have that kind of crick so that's great in a way because like gives you so grateful yeah exactly it's your fuel for awakening yeah jimmy wants to give you a little massage that's um but it really you know it really it really can help us see what you described which is we can often feel like this crick in my neck it's like ruining my day like my entire day is focused on this crick in my neck when actually like a lot of other things are happening moments that are okay, moments that are different pain, right? And it's, it really helps us investigate and like pull apart, like, yeah, like it hurts and then other things hurt. And actually it doesn't have to be the entire focus of my experience. Like that's, that's Vipassana, that's direct seeing and knowing insight. I could just tell you that, like, it's not, it's not hurting all day. And you're like, Hmm. But to actually notice that it changes and shifts like that is the kind of insight um, that we hope for. Um, And then, you know, attention and awareness. So we think of attention as like this searchlight. I use these words interchangeably because I also think it can be helpful too. But I often think of attention as like this searchlight, you know, this more directed light. And we put the searchlight of our attention onto different areas, right? So I'm attending to my breath. I'm attending to my emotion. I'm attending to the sound outside. And it is like it's moving around. It's all moving around within the spaciousness of awareness. Mm-hmm. And what I think you also hit on in a way is that like our true refuge is the spaciousness of awareness. So, of course, it's helpful for us to use attention and training our attention can give us more access to spacious awareness. That's kind of a weird thing to say. Again, way more helpful to experience it. But if we can steady our attention to be on something like the breath, we can actually start to relax. And often in practices here, we go from that focused attention to that more open awareness and presence. And the next phase of mindfulness of um, the Satipatthana Sutta is like the mindfulness of the mind. And in that, in that one, you know, just as we are attending these different sensations, we can attend to thoughts coming and going, but rest in the awareness. And then as a spoiler alert, the hope is we're not only just, you know, kind of feeling awareness, and then attending to things, but we actually collapse it and we experience what's you know often called a non-dual, but just a pervasive awareness. And so there's not as though it's like, oh, I'm observing this thing. It's we are aware and our awareness includes everything. And that's not, it sounds very fancy, but we have that experience all the time where it's not like, oh, I'm observing this thing. It's just, there's a sense of awareness. It feels spacious. It feels open. I don't know. They need to come up with a lot more synonyms for spacious and open because I use those words too much. But that's what it feels like. Yeah. Please do that. Yeah. It kind of feels like when you're awake, like when you're awake and you're like right now, we're just talking, right? Mm -hmm. Like my attention is to like what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. my awareness, like uh, it's like it's all around. Yes. So it's like the same thing. But meditation is like with your eyes closed and yes. like not talking. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the like 
right now our awareness that is greater than just listening to me, but like, oh, my foot's on the floor and I'm wearing this sweater, right? You know, we are kind of tamping down different channels of sensory experience, different thoughts and focusing in one. When we rest in a spacious awareness, we're not getting involved with any thought or feeling. They're just like arising and passing. And it is totally a, a trip um, to have that experience where you realize you don't have to always be engaged. It's this deep leaning back kind of feeling as well. One mental image that comes up is like turning off the head torch and just letting the night vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're not looking at this thing and that thing. And I don't want to preference it by saying, oh, it's it's the best. I mean, it is very nourishing and helpful. But training our focused attention gives us so many benefits too. Um, some inordinate amount of Alan's 45 books are on training attention. Um, it's, you know, a really profound practice. But yeah, thank you for sharing that. My goodness, here we are. Um, yeah, great questions. And I'm just really encouraged because, again, we have to try out and really feel these teachings. Um, just hearing about them is so hard. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a teacher who I heard talk about his experience with chronic pain mm. and um, and he was part of, yeah, some, I guess at Stanford, they were doing research on chronic pain and he had said something like that they were finding that, um, I guess, I don't know what the exact words are, but like that your field of awareness sort of, or like consciousness mm -hmm. does de like its size, like actually decreases when folks are experiencing chronic pain and and then hearing um, the other yogi talk about pain and how like the attention will sort of go back to that spot. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if if you know more about that and if that's related to like why that happens oh, that. Um, yeah, folks attention or con consciousness yeah. kind of starts to like, yeah, really narrow. You're hitting on the right words attention and con and uh sorry attention awareness and consciousness and mm -hmm. um what i love is we cannot measure awareness and consciousness and unfortunately all of neuroscience almost all of it it conflates the brain consciousness and awareness mm -hmm. so what's happening in the brain and we have no evidence it's called the hard problem of consciousness we actually can't measure consciousness in the brain it's somewhat bigger than what we can like identify and recognize so when we say our i think when we like say the field of awareness is shrunk we are really talking about the attention being more focused and i think it's really hard to access spacious awareness when something so pronounced like pain <clears throat> is happening, but with chronic pain, um, it really, again, just as um, he described, it undulates, like it's not always acute. There are these periods of rest. And so it's, I'd like to think of it as that we can permeate the density of our attention with awareness, right? So we can just, okay, like, in this moment, it has shifted and it's different. In this moment, it's not even there. In this moment, it's back. And so it's like we're wedging in awareness and like helping to desolidify some of that focused attention because all of our evolutionary history in a good way makes our attention focus on pain because it's a signal. So, yeah. And what are they measuring then? Like Probably like uh, brain activity. Um, but again, the brain is not, had never been demonstrated to, um, be able to fully capture consciousness or awareness. So you can just capture movements of the mind. <clears throat> Happy to share a lot of dorky resources on that for anyone who's interested. My Thank area you. of passion. Yeah. It's, it, I find it really exciting. Do you find it frustrating when sometimes people will overstate what we know from neuroscience and say that we understand awareness and consciousness, but 
We don't. But yeah, it's like you could through meditation, there are times where it's like, oh, everything is producing consciousness yes. and it doesn't even have a location. Yes. So how could you even measure it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the funny thing. Yeah. Alan has um, started a contemplative con contemplative science um, research observatory where all of the scientists are trained in shamatha attention. So they, all the neuroscientists know the meditation and then are exploring. Cause I think otherwise it's just a terminology thing, but it's so sad to think that our consciousness and existence is only this body and brain function that really doesn't capture like the great mystery of the world, nor thousands of years of like indigenous knowledge and wisdom about a greater spiritual life. So I don't buy it <laughs> as a scientist and as a yogi. So thank you so much. Yeah. So let's take a moment to dedicate our practice. So just returning our attention and awareness to the body and the breath. And taking a moment and considering our intention for being here, this aspiration to show up and cultivate the mind, heart, and body for the sake of all beings. And consider dedicating any effort, any benefit from this practice to that aspiration. And so symbolically offering and considering this outrageous possibility that our effort here tonight could contribute to all beings being free. All beings knowing the true causes of happiness. All beings feeling love and belonging. Thank you all so much.